All right, our next type of commercial agriculture is the dairying. So dairying is the growth of milk-based products for the marketplace. And dairy farms closest to the marketplace usually produce the most perishable fluid milk products, while those farther away produce goods such as cheese and butter, which are goods that are less perishable, but they're still made of milk. Um, it is most economically productive type of commercial agriculture, and it's usually practiced near the cities in the northeastern United States and the southeastern Canada, and also in northwestern Europe. Farms are usually very small, and they're very capital, or basically the money, uh, cash intensive. Um, the milk shed is one of our vocab terms. It's the zone around the city center, which is the milk can be produced and shipped to the marketplace without spoiling. Now, the growth in transportation technologies, such as refrigeration and refrigerated trucks, have over the years enabled dairy farmers to locate, uh, locate them farther south from the city center, and therefore it increases the area of the milk shed. In fact, the improved technology and feeding systems have led to an increase in the milk amount of milk produced uh, per cow. Okay, then we also have um, large-scale grain production. So wheat is dominant grain on large-scale grain farms, where the grains are most often grown to be exported to other places for consumption. Large-scale grain production is mostly common in Canada, the United States, Argentina, Australia, France, England, and the Ukraine. Which actually, the Ukraine is actually known as the breadbasket, in quotes, of Russia. Whereas the United States in the world, um, the United States is actually the world's largest uh, large-scale grain producer. So wheat is the world's um, leading export crop and it is dominated from the United States and Canadian farms. Um, large-scale large grain farms grew during the Industrial Revolution and it created a uh, large city-based populations needing wheat and other grains for consumption. Now also on the screen, again, those um, large machines, a lot of the large-scale grain farms are usually highly mechanized, capital-intensive operations. So some inventions to be kind of familiar with that actually helped with the growth of large-scale grain farming, we have the McCormick Reaper, which developed in the 1800s. It's basically the machine that cuts the standing grain in the field and also the Columbine machine, uh, the Combine machine, which actually completes the three processes of reaping, threshing, and cleaning in one machine. All right, another form of commercial agriculture we take a look at is plantation agriculture, and this involves large-scale farming operations, um, called plantations, makes sense, and agricultural states that specialize in farming in one or two high-demand crop, crops for export. Um, plantation agriculture is usually associated with the tropical and subtropical climate zones. Um, and some crops that I want you to make sure you're familiar with when you think about plantation agriculture. I want you to associate that with coffee, um, also tea, pineapples, palms, coconuts, rubber, tobacco, sugarcane, and cotton. Today, plantation agriculture is still largely reflective of what you could kind of say is the global power structure because many of those plantations exist in low altitude um, regions such as Africa, Asia, and Latin America, but they're actually owned by companies from more MDC countries who often take some of the best farmland from the native farmers, leaving local farmers with very living, uh, little land. Um, so even though modern plantations have integrated advanced technology into their farming, plantation agriculture for the most part is still very labor intensive and it's requiring the hiring of a large number of seasonal workers during uh, harvest time. All right, next in this unit, obviously you need to know this is the go-to model for agriculture. I promise at least there'll be at least one question regarding von Thunen. Uh, he's been very popular. We have um, some FRQ questions in the past, so you never know, roll the dice, we could see another one again. So von Thunen, remember, was a 19th century German economist who actually created this model trying to explain and predict where and why different agriculture activities would take place around the city marketplace. So von Thunen, remember we talked about, he has several assumptions or things that again are kind of the givens. He assumed that there is only one city with one central marketplace where all the farmers would sell their products and try to make the most money they can. When in doubt, again, people are trying to make the most money. He assumed that the farmland was all equitably farmable and productive, and there's only one type of transportation mode. 
So given these types of assumptions, von Thunen really uh, allowed for only one variable to change in this model. The distance from the farm's location from the city market as evident of transportation cost. So when you think about the agricultural land settlement patterns predicted by the model, in this model, the central marketplace is surrounded by agricultural activity zones. So that's why we see those different rings represent the different types of land use. So moving outward from the city central marketplace, the farming activities change from intensive to more extensive. So Inversely, switch that up, if you travel from the outermost rings to the city central marketplace, you would travel through rings of extensive practices like grazing into more intensive farming practices like horticulture and dairying. So the reasons explain the von, uh, von Thunen model predictions. So basically the land closest to the city marketplace is more expensive, so land rent or the land price is more expensive. The land farther away, of course, is cheaper. A grain farmer who needs a lot of land for their extensive farming operation is probably going to purchase a farm farther away from the city marketplace because the land is less, less expensive. You need more of it, you need cheaper land cost. Whereas on the flip side, the milk producer is actually likely to buy land closer to the city center because she doesn't need extensive land uh, to produce the same profit. So a dairy farm also, of course, we need to make sure it's close to the marketplace because we want to make sure the milk gets there before it spoils. So overall, again, good to know, the model pretty much emphasizes the influence of distance as a factor in human location decisions. So according to von Thuden, farming decisions, like so many other spatial patterns we see with our other units, relate to distance. And geographers analyze farming land uses in particular areas um, they compare them to von Thunen's hypothetical situation in order to explain what they see and, what, of course, what they predict future land use patterns could be. All right, also in this unit, you need to be familiar with something known as the Green Revolution. So to review, the Green Revolution began in the 1940s and was a phase of the Third Agricultural Revolution, which the Third Agricultural Revolution is basically sort of the shift that saw 19th century that saw the globalization of industrialized agriculture and new technologies that increased the food supply. So remember, the first agriculture revolution kind of started the stationary plant and animal domestication. The second agriculture revolution saw new farming and storage practices, capabilities to try to increase the food supply. So in this case, the green revolution falls in um, it began with the agriculture experiments that were funded by the U.S. charities, trying to find ways to improve Mexico's wheat production and capabilities to reduce hunger in that particular region. So scientists, they started explaining, uh, experimenting, I should say, and they found new hybrid strains of wheat, maize, and rice that were higher yielding, capable of producing more food at a faster pace. Scientists also developed new fertilizers and pesticides that supported higher yielding seeds that required special nitrogen enriching fertilizers and increased protection from diseases and pest infestations. All right, think about the pros and cons of the Green Revolution. So of course, the miracle of the Green Revolution was the diffusion of higher yielding seeds, varieties, and the ability to grow more food. So globally, grain production actually increased by 45% between the years of 1945 and 1990. Um, but of course, with anything, there is negative aspects. So environmental damage could be um, consideration. The fact that um, you know workers are frequently exposed to chemicals that are being used. We also see that uh, the Green Revolution crops require more watering. Water resources are being strained. And just the cost itself. Um, so in the sense that um, local farmers in peripheral countries often have a difficult time purchasing the more expensive Green Revolution seeds, often driving them out of the market and causing them economic ruin. So pros and cons of the Green Revolution. Also, with any of our models or our theories or these developments, think about the positive and negative impacts using ESPN, of course. All right, let's go ahead and talk about environmental. So using ESPN, some environmental consequences that you should be familiar with. Um, so of course, due to population pressures, farmers in many regions are trying to grow food at faster rates. 
and often do not allow their soils enough time to rest or actually recuperate from the last harvest. So these types of practices actually lead to negative consequence of something called soil erosion, and is basically the loss of the nutrient-rich top layer soil. So some geographers estimate that 7% of the world's rich topsoil is actually being destroyed each decade, which is pretty severe. We also talked about environmental impact of something called desertification. So this is related to the human overuse of the land, and it's the loss of the habitable land and the expansion of the Earth's deserts. So through this process, this can result from you know, human or natural causes. Um, and humans have contributed to the expansion, for example, the Sahara Desert because their overly intense use of the land. Um, also, again, you should be familiar with the concept of deforestation. So this is the loss of land that's forested areas. It's caused by the humans by chopping down the forest areas um, at rates so fast that the forest areas cannot actually have time to regenerate. Of course, we could not forget in agriculture our discussion of biotechnology. Um, so agricultural biotechnology is the use, uh, I should say, using living organisms to produce or change plant or animal products. And we talked about GMOs. So genetic modification is a form of biotechnology that uses scientific genetic man manipulation to crop and animal products to improve agricultural productivity and products. So basically reorganizing plant and animal DNA and tissue uh, culturing are two examples of how the genetically uh, modified process uh, in agricultural biotechnology. So recent innovations in biotech have led to plant and animal clothing as well as kind of like super plants that grow as much uh, faster rate, even more um, you know, nutrient poor soils, and have already, uh, already have embedded in them the pesticides and fertilizers into their DNA. All right, and then last but not least, part of agriculture, there's also one of our standards that addresses something called rural settlement. Um, so there's different types of rural settlements and the three on the screen you should be familiar with um, relating to our discussion of density. So remember, um, thinking about how to use your geographic vocabulary and an FRQ. If you're gonna talk about settlement, you could refer to them as clustered. And this is where, again, small families live in very close proximity. Um, we have something called linear. And this is, again, where compromise the, the buildings are kind of clustered along a road or a river, kind of like in a line. Makes sense, linear. And then we also have something called dispersed. So in dispersed, farmers live on individual farms and very isolated um, neighbors. So a visual on the screen, again, we have um, clustered in the top uh, left, you can see. Um, on in the center of the screen you have linear again in this case it's uh, along the water source so you can see the different fields and the housings linear um, settlement and then the last one is more that dispersed where again you see much more space between the settlements finally you want to make sure you're familiar with um, our discussion of organic farming which has become very popular in recent years trying to move away from GMOs, trying to move away from chemical per pesticides and fertilizers, um, and then also responding to something called the local food movement. So this is again where we have again local um, farmers and community members coming together. This is where again we have, uh, you know, think about we have our downtown Anaheim farmers market. So trying to buy local and trying to support local farmers um, to try to fight agribusiness, so to speak. Maybe I should finish off there. Again, I put agribusiness on the screen. So just a last minute reminder. Remember, agribusiness is the term that we actually use for the combination of the food production industry. So that includes the farms, the processing plants, the packagers, the fertilizer, laboratories, distributors, uh, and advertising. So agribusiness in the modern food system is everything that involving the development of seeds all the way to the market. So with that, I'll go ahead and close it off. Remember, agriculture, 15 to 17% of the questions on the test will be relating to this unit. So make sure you review and make sure you study agriculture. I'll see you in class, folks.